Modern racking has a lot of similarities regardless of whether you're on a rooftop or um, on the ground. You know, uh, essentially, you put, you, you attach these, these sticks of rail to the rooftop. And then the solar panels get clamped to the rail. So the solar panels kind of sit on top of this rail. Now, uh, poking a hole in a roof can be a little daunting. You know, it's... Um, the last thing you want to do is poke a bunch of holes in a, a rooftop and cause a bunch of roof leaks, right? You don't want to make the, the problem the customer's home worse by installing solar in a poor manner. But the fact is, solar is not the only thing that pokes a hole in the rooftop. You know, chimneys are big giant holes in the rooftop. And even shingles get nailed into the roof. So, obviously, there's, there's ways to make holes in rooftops in a waterproof, professional manner. Um, the way that these rails attach to the roof are through you know, what are called positive attachments. Not a very creative term there. But these attachments are, are customized to the roof surface. And so here is a, a standard um, attachment for roof shingles. And it comes with a little bit of a, of a this is called flashing. It comes with a little bit of a, a metal flashing that, that gets under the shingle and we're going to watch a video on that in a minute to see it how it works with rain. Um, but what you can see between the, um, you know, the shingle rooftop and this tile roof is regardless, they, they have this little, you know, base that covers and kind of fits into the roof. Um, and then there's this little metal piece that comes off of the base. You know, this metal piece is called an L foot because it's shaped like an L and it just comes off of the attachment and raises up and it gives a, a spot for the solar rail to hook onto. And so many solar racking systems consist of rails and L feet and some kind of attachment point that's customized for the rooftop. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. There's, there's all sorts of attachment pieces for whatever roof you're on. So, you know, underneath here, this is a attachment for a standing seam metal rooftop that kind of clamps onto the metal roof and doesn't actually penetrate through. Now, this is a, a trapezoidal metal roof. So this is a, a metal roof where the, the roofing profile kind of looks like this. Whereas a, a standing seam metal roof looks like that. And so on a standing seam metal rooftop, there's clamps that clamp around the standing seam. Uh, on a, when you don't have that standing seam, you got to drill a hole through the rooftop. And... You know, on a metal roof, as opposed to a shingled roof, it's just one big flat sheet of metal. You know, the shingles cover up the roofing nails and the rain stays on top of the shingles and they're kind of layered on top of each other to make the thing waterproof. If you're drilling a hole through a metal roof, there's no shingles. And so the likelihood of a roof leak is even greater. And that doesn't stop the solar industry. You know what? happens in solar is when you're up on the rooftop and you're drilling these screws into this rooftop and you're like wow i'm i'm really drilling a whole bunch of holes in the roof you know these attachments are generally these holes in the roofs that you're making are you know you're there with your power tool uh you can you can kind of get a feel 
for if that screw is solidly going into the roof or not. And you're right up there making every attachment point. So if you're doing your job, it doesn't stop the solar industry from having a job site. You know, what leaks on a rooftop after an install is not what the work that you've done. It's the stuff that's already up on a roof and you've been walking around on a roof with these heavy solar panels and, you know, you step in the wrong spot on a roof you slide your foot, step on, you know, too close to an existing plumbing vent or something like that. Um, you're damaging the waterproofing that's already up there. So you got to be careful when you're on the roof to step carefully, but it's not really the solar array that causes a leak if a leak does occur. occur. And it's kind of funny, the, it's very rare to have a leaky roof in solar. It's much more likely that there's going to be some other kind of project issue. So getting back on track, this is a, a attachment, a positive attachment for a metal roofing system that doesn't have this standing seam to clamp onto. And so they're just screwing right into the rooftop with these screws and there's some some sealant underneath here that the rainwater just comes and falls and then goes around the attachment point and then here's a, a different kind of attachment for a, a different trapezoidal metal rooftop and so you know basically there is a racking solution for any kind of roof no matter what you're on shingle tile metal uh it doesn't matter it's just there's a a different a different positive attachment depending on what material you're working with so how does the solar panels how do they atta attach to this rail how do they go on top of the rail? Well, they're clamped to it. So we got these this series of, of clips that secure the solar panel down onto this racking system. So you know, pay attention to these little tabs here and these little tabs here. You know, these these tabs down at the bottom slide into this channel. In the rail so the 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 this it's this is called a T bolt because it has a little T head on it but this T bolt kind of goes down into the channel of the rail and then gets turned around and that T locks it into the channel so it can't it can't go anywhere and so this thing sticks down into the rack and secures it and this top clip gets screwed down the solar panel goes between the cl the top clip and the bottom clip it goes in the middle so the sol solar panel is going you know here this is the the solar panel module frame and this this top flange secures the top of the panel and the rail secures the bottom of the panel so it's like a a clamping system this end goes into the rail and then the top end gets screwed down and it sandwiches the solar array between the rail and the clip so even on a ground mount system you're you're generally dealing with these clips although on the rooftop these clips go on top of the modules uh, sometimes on the ground mounts they'll use clips that go underneath the modules uh, sometimes that can be a little easier to work with. I actually don't think so. I think top mounted is is the easiest way. Uh, this clip on the right versus this clip in the middle are are two different but similar clips. The one in the the one here is called a mid clamp. The one on the end here is called an end clamp. You know, basically the end clamps go at the 
ends of the solar array, the mid clamps go between two modules. So this little tiny spacer here is the gap, a uh, like little gap of air between two module frames, like a spacer. I don't know if any of y'all do tile work, but when you're tiling a bathroom, you're putting little spacers between the tiles to, to keep them nice and uniform. Um, you know, these mid clamps kind of space out the solar panels with this little tab. So mid clamps go between two panels, end clamps go at the end. Why don't we watch some videos to uh, better feel that out? I'm gonna watch uh So here's our, our first video. I have the, the sound unit, I'm just gonna narrate it. So what you can see is there's these flash pads that uh slide up underneath the shingle. So a substantial portion of this flash pad actually goes underneath the the shingle so you know look how how tall this flash pad is here's the one that's installed this flash pad is actually going up and all the way under a whole level of shingles and then some and so it's any any water that's on you know not just the immediate next row of shingles but even the one that's another layer up is falling you know if water gets into these gaps between the shingles it's not supposed to but if it does it falls onto this flash pad rather than getting underneath the rooftop so that's actually uh, uh, one of the most time intensive processes on the on the job is you'll get a little pry bar to stick up underneath these shingles and kind of pry up any roofing nails so that you can slide the flashing all the way under. So what he's showing now is the actual lag screw that goes into the roof. So these lag screws, they're, they're quite robust. You know, they're a quarter inch thick, you know, about three and a half to four inches long. You know, they're, they're something, they're a serious piece of metal right there. And that gets screwed into the rafter from the top of the roof. So you're not just screwing through the roof into the roof. You're, there's, and we're going to talk about this in, in a couple days. Um, but you're actually identifying where the rafters are underneath the rooftop and then screwing these, these rather substantial bolts into uh, and well into the rafter. You know, they're going a couple of inches into the rafter. Those guys are, are very strong once they go into the rafter. You know, if you're screwing these big metal spikes into your uh, rafters, that solar array is not going anywhere. It's very important, by the way, to make sure you hit the rafters. And uh, yes, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna show you some techniques for doing that. But you know, you definitely on your first couple of rooftop projects need to be working with someone who's experienced so that they can help you identify where those rafter locations are. If you don't if you don't hit the rafter, you don't get a very strong connection between uh, the racking and the roof. And so if you don't have a strong connection between the racking and the roof, then you could cause a roof leak. So it's very important that when you're driving these these long spikes into uh, the rooftop that uh, you're hitting the rafters. We'll talk more about that later. So he's holding the lag screw and there's the, the L foot. And so what he's done here is here there you can see he's kind of prying up the shingles with that pry bar now it goes it takes a lot more time than what he just did it, it's you know particularly on some roofs so now he's taking his sealant gun 
And let's show that, let's show all this again. So right now, he's simulating prying up the shingle with this little pry bar. Let's take a closer look at that. So he has this, this metal pry bar. You can get them at your Lowe's or Home Depot. And it, it's going up under not just this first course of shingles, but up into the second course of shingles. Because whatever roofing nails are in this area, he needs to he needs to pry up out of there so that he can slide his shingle underneath. Or his flashing. So he's you know, they've the his construction manager has already marked out where the rafters are. You can see this this red chalk line um, that identifies his mounting location. We're gonna talk more about that in a couple days. But he's taking this flashing, and the next part is sealant. So sealant is definitely your friend on a job site. You should always have a, a caulk gun and some sealant uh, on site. And uh, generally speaking, solar installers will will use higher end sealant. You got to understand the the rooftop is one of the most intense places on your building. You know, your rooftop is outside all the time, exposed to the sun all day long, every single day. I mean, imagine if you just went outside and stood in in the sun wearing black clothing every single day of the year you'd be looking pretty weathered after a you know a decade of of being outside like john does <laughs> yeah like working in the solar industry um but uh what what they're doing here is applying some sealant around uh, the flashing so that if any water does in fact make it underneath the uh, the shingle if any water does make it under the flashing it'll hit the sealant and then work its way out so it's a combination of using these flashing pads and sealant but you use sealant for so much on the job site let's say you think the rafter is right here and so you drill a little hole but it turns out the rafter was an inch over. You know, that little hole gets filled up with sealant and then the flash pad goes around it. And so it's all right if you, I mean, it's not great, but it's okay if you drill a hole into the roof right around where you're supposed to be and it turns out that you didn't find the rafter right. There are some tricks you can do at that point to make sure that the second time you drill a hole through the roof you actually hit the rafter so long as you're close but you know what sealant does is it is it it's forgiving you know if you drill a hole in the roof and it's not supposed to be there you fill it in with you know high-end roofing grade sealant and it um you know that's if you accidentally bash a hole through the roof somehow you know, sealing is your friend on but fixing it. But you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that because you're so well trained. So they're putting the sealant in. And now that's the lag screw. And so what you, what you haven't seen in this video is he's already drilled a pilot hole. So you're not just screwing the lag screw directly in the roof. Ahead of that, you're using your um, your driver to drill a hole that is not quite the the same width as the lag screw. It's a little bit smaller than the lag screw because you you definitely want the lag screw to fill up the whole hole. You don't want there to be any gaps. You don't want to drill too large of a hole for your lag screw. Um, but they've already identified where that rafter is. They've already drilled their pilot hole. So now they're ready to uh, install the flashing. 
So they're putting their sealant on, making a nice ring all the way around the, the hole. Sometimes these flash pads have channels for you to put the sealant into. And so he's lining up the, the flashing with that pilot hole. And that's going to allow him to lag screw into the, the uh, roof very easily. Sorry, I'm just checking my video feed right now. And so at the, after that point, you've done all your work. You put the, the lag screw into the, the hole. And so now your, your, your attachment is protected. You know, that, that lag screw, instead of being directly on the roof deck, it's, it's up off of the roof deck. Now I want to show you something. You know, back in the day, 10 years ago, when I got into solar, they did not have these nice uh, flashed L feet. So you can, you can see here, here's some channels in this flashing for some sealant. And so this sealant is going up and, and around wherever this penetration is. And then even, even this, they have a little bit of a, a standoff before you get to this lag screw. Now, back in the day, we didn't have these nice flashing systems made for solar. And so the guy who brought me into the industry, you know, he didn't use flashing. And he just lag screwed directly into the rooftop and then... In a in not just an amateur way, but in a very professional way, he would take his sealant and get underneath the L foot and on top of the L foot and all around the L foot and just kind of mash the L foot onto the rooftop with plenty of sealant and lag screw straight straight through. And we never had any problems with that, you know. So. So just the lag screw and the sealant when you're hitting the rafter, you know, generally that's enough to prevent a leak, although it's not considered to be uh, the best practice. You know, what happened uh, is over the next few years, the racking company said, oh, let's, let's make flashing. And so now the, it's, it's standard to have this flashing there. Um, but I would say that the sealant is just as important as the flashing. Well, this is this is the best part. So now he's he's lag screwed the L foot in, and he's pouring the water. And so what you can see is that the water is just go staying on top of the shingles and then hitting that flashing and going ar around the attachment point. So you know, the water comes and then it goes when it hits this this guard, you know, no, the 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 concern is that it's right around this bolt, but you know, as we know, we have our our sealant around there. And this little standoff is integrated into the flashing. So when the water hits it, it just flows right over and, and keeps going down. Okay. Now, sometimes rooftops can't be flashed. You know, if you do solar on a on a trailer home, you know, a really really cheap home. Sometimes, you know, I don't know if I really agree with the philosophy, but some customers have a really cheap home and they still want to put an expensive solar array on top. I guess no one likes their electric bill. And so here's an example of a system that doesn't use flashing at all. 
Now, Unirack makes a flashed system, and most installers use flashed systems. Um, but let's say you get to a rooftop and it has rolled shingles like this, where uh, you know there's no there's no shingles to really put your flashing underneath, or on a trailer home. Sometimes they use the very cheapest shingles possible. I have a question about what does happen if you put a hole in the roof. Yeah. What, what does happen? You yeah. fix it. It's okay. It, it's easy to fix. You yeah. So if aware. you, if you, yeah, we're, we'll talk about that in a minute. Good question. Um, so if you have the cheapest of shingles, you might not be able to pry them up off the roof without destroying the shingling system. You have to be smart on a, especially on a retrofit older roof because the roof might look good to you, but you might find when you actually get up on it that the shingles are just old enough that, um, that if you start abusing them with that pry bar where you're sticking the pry bar underneath the shingles to pry up the roofing nails, you might find that the shingles just start falling apart. You know, I, before you get any further, it, you might be able to rescue that project without replacing the whole roof by selecting an on top of the roof system that doesn't use flashing. You know, I, I suppose the best practice is if the shingles are, are falling off the roof while you're installing it to, to then notify the customer and have them re-shingle the roof. Um, so at any rate, let's uh, kind of watch through this video. I have it on mute so I can narrate it. You know, here they're they're pounding the roof with a hammer, and that's a, a typical way of identifying where the rafters are. You can kind of feel where they are. Someone who's experienced can feel where they are. You know, generally what I will do to identify rafters is I will first start in the attic and I'll measure the rafters in the attic, generally speaking. Not, not measuring each individual rafter to make sure each individual rafter is exactly you know, 18 inches on center or whatever. You know, I might check to see how uniform the attic is to see if they are on center or slightly off. Um, but you just go into the attic first to identify your, your rafter spacings so that then when you're up on the rooftop doing, you know, the hammer test, you know, you're banging the roof and then you're like, okay, I find a rafter. What I do is I take a, a white paint pen and I, right where I think there's a rafter, I dab it with a, a dot. I guess this is stuff that, you know, we're going to come back to the, the kind of foreman training uh, in a couple of days. But once I, since we're here, might as well introduce it. Yeah, you know, once I'm banging the roof with a hammer and I think I know where the rafter is, I, I take a, a, a wax crayon or a white paint pen and I dab the roof. I say, I think this is where the rafter is. And then I go... You know, eight. if I know my rafter spacing is, say, 18 inches, I'll go 18 inches or 24 inches or whatever it comes out to be. I'll uh, go that distance down the roof and start banging my hammer again. And when I think I know where the rafter is, I'll bang the dot there. And then I'll measure the distance between the two. And if that is consistent with the distance spacing that I've measured inside the attic, then I know I'm on track. And so I'll actually do that at different points along the roof, a form a grid, form a chalk line, hit the rafters. We're going to talk about all of that in a couple of days, probably on Thursday. So for now, we'll call that an advanced technique. You know, once you identify where the rafter is, you drill into the roof 
And the way you know that you actually hit the rafter when you're drilling into the roof is as you're drilling, wood chips from the rafter start to come out of the hole. You know, you're, you're either underneath the roof, so this is your roof deck, and here are your rafters, you know, spaced apart. When you're drilling into the roof, if you miss the rafter, your drill bit's just going to, you know, after giving you a little bit of resistance to the roof deck, it's just going to shoot right through the rooftop. And you're like, oh, that's a empty space down there. I missed it. Whereas if you're actually lag screwing into the rafter, you're feeling the resistance of the rafter itself and you're seeing the wood chips come out of the hole. So you absolutely know when you hit a rafter versus when you did it. And so the question becomes, well, what if you do poke a hole in the rooftop? Well, usually that, that hole is near the rafter. And so not only are you filling up that hole with sealant, but then you're also, your flashing pad is going to cover any near misses. And so you're doubly waterproofed with sealant and flashing. Now, if you just go and drill a hole, you know, right here in the middle of the shingle and drill a hole through the roof that way, you know, the, the first step would be to just fill it up with roofing sealant. Um, it's, you would need an experienced roofer uh, to be able to f identify, you know, what one course of shingles, how to stitch that back into the rooftop. It's not a easy process, but, uh, you know, a, a pro roofer would take, if you put just a hole randomly anywhere in the roof, they would fill that up with sealant and then maybe put their own metal flash pad you know, around the greater area to give it some additional protection. So anyway, they're drilling into the rooftop, the pilot hole, and you can see those wood chips come out at the end right there. That's how you know you hit the rafter. So they're saying work on a clean roof. You know, you, if there's leaves and debris, you know, snow, clear that off the roof first. So here they've, they've made a pilot hole that they've missed and they've just filled it in with goop. So here they're using a, a product that doesn't have any flashing that just kind of sits on top of the roof. And these products are more controversial in the solar industry. They've been on the market for years, maybe eight years or more. So it's not like they're not field tested and it's not like they're not problematic. It's just that um, flashing is considered to be a more waterproof technique than not using flashing. And these systems simply do not use flashing. So installers actually like them because they're a little bit easier to install. Um, but the professional solar outfits tend to use flashing. And I think flashing is a little bit more forgiving. If you're, if you're using, generally speaking, if you're using like a specialty solution, you're you're either having to because of the roof type you have a metal roof so you need a special system for a metal roof um or you need to be very careful and very precise you're using this system to save time but you're not you're losing the benefits of the flashing and so you can't have as many mistakes as you could with a flashing system but basically what this is doing is putting some sealant underneath the attachment and when this screws down, the sealant mushes out and it forms, you know, a waterproof barrier. And this is, it's not uncommon. I mean, on a metal roof, on a barn, you get a, a fastener, you know, 
You know, if you go to Home Depot, metal roofing screws. You know, this is this is a picture of a metal. Come on. What's going on here? You know, this is a, a picture of a metal roofing screw. And you can see this little rubber neoprene pad here. Do you see this? We have a question about the kind of roofs. Okay. Um, would it matter if, say, you put it on a uh, slate or a clay roof? Like, can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that, oh, sure. Okay. Um, Let's see if I can't find a, a picture. Here we go. Oof. Um, so here's an example of a, of a metal roofing system. I guess the, the resolution's bad, but what you can see, even with this low resolution, is that there's these screws that are just screwing directly through the roof into the rooftop, and they use these metal roofing screws uh, relying on... There we go. Uh, relying on the... You know, the, the little rubber washer to provide the waterproofing. Oh, uh, where did my video go? And so this is this is kind of the same concept where the 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 flashing the the systems that don't use flashing have this you know, goop that presses out when the the attachment is pushed down onto the uh, shingle. So now there, you can see there's no flashing underneath this system. Um, does the rubber seal get dry rot? Yeah, these. So it it depends. Um. All flat, all sealant eventually will become brittle. Um, but why does it become brittle? You know, mostly it becomes brittle from exposure to the sun. And so the sealant that's underneath it, um, it keep in mind you're using top shelf sealant, but uh, there's you're using so much sealant. <laughs> well, let's just watch the video for a minute. You know, they're they're saying, hey, if on on certain rooftops where there's big variation in shingle thickness, this system doesn't work. You know, but basically, right here, <laughs> they're filling up the whole inside of this cavity with sealant. So the, the, they're using a ton of sealant on these systems. What is underneath here, what is actually underneath forming this little black pad is, is butyl sealant. So it's even, it's even higher end than the stuff you buy in a, a stick and put on a caulk gun and, and seal down there. So uh butyl tape has been it's like an industrial grade sticky tack it's uh yeah it's very hardy to to last a very long time so uh i wouldn't worry too much about the sealant drying out it's going to be shaded underneath the solar array you're using a lot of it 
Uh, generally, the sealant that's going to dry out is stuff that's exposed to the, the sun. Yeah, can you just, me and Justin, Justin and I were just talking, can you just say a little bit about what it would be like if it were a slate roof or something else like that? Yeah. So, on a, the, the hardest projects are pure tile rooftops, whether they be slate or Spanish tile. And uh, some installers, their advice when you get to a tile roof is to run away. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't take those jobs. Leave them, leave them for someone else to do. And I, I do think there's some wisdom in that. But theoretically, you could put solar on any roof, right? I mean, it, it's just some roofs are better than others, or is that? Yeah, yeah. So theoretically, you can find a roofing system for any type of roof. So there, the solar racking manufacturers have gotten good enough now where you can give them almost any profile for like a slate tile rooftop and the, instead of flashing, um, you get a replacement tile that just replaces the, the tile that's on the roof. It didn't used to be that way. So here's a, a Spanish tile job we did where they have these hooks that, that you, you literally take the whole roof apart and stack that tile up on the side of the roof. Now, we didn't do that. We hired a roofing contractor, uh, the one who actually mm -hmm. built this house, to come out and help us take that tile off and then put these hooks down through the rooftop and then put the tile back on. And that's that's a, a labor-intense process. Would you say that you could probably put solar on any roof, but the cost is going to go up? If on certain rooftop, right? I mean, yeah, you, you could probably get anything you want if you're willing to pay enough for it. But you know, you'd have to ask the customer whether or not that was something they even wanted to get into. Yeah. but it's definitely possible. And so the the real problem with tile rooftops is not all tile roofing systems, but many tile roofing systems are so interlocked that you have to take that whole section of the roof apart then put your attachments down and kind of retile as you're putting your attachments down. Um, and, and that's the hard part. But uh, let me, let me just show of, you a couple other examples. I think what, one of the things is that it, it takes a while to adjust to the idea that you're putting holes in a roof. Because it sounds so wrong, but if you really think about it, you know, there's all kinds of things on your roof, on any roof. There's, you know, the fireplace and there's all kinds of things and people do it. It's just, uh, it's hard to think about because your whole, your whole thought process is never put a hole in a roof. But if you do it the right way with the right tools, then, you know, there's, there's no problem, right? People put skylights in and stuff like that. And they yeah. And so, so here is a, a Spanish tile roof. And what you can see on, you know, kind of very quickly underneath this. Um, there we go. That's a good picture. Is uh, the, the rooftop has these wood battens on them. And then that's really what you're trying to expose is you're trying to, to get you know, if you're using these hooks, you're trying to, to lag screw into these wood battens. Um, and then quick mount came back and said, you know, that's not good enough. Cause what would happen is these, you would install these little hooks that would screw into these wood battens. And then the hook would kind of snake out from underneath the, the tile but you would still get this little interference that would want to push up on the tile that the hook was coming out of it. So your roof would still have to, you, you do as tight of a job as you could, but you'd still have to um, have a little bit of imperfection in that roof. Now, you know, the water would still drip down onto the tile and be, you know, relatively waterproof, but uh, you could imagine that that could get out of control. Um, I'm going to come back to this video in a minute. On the... Uh, let's 
So here's that that might make this little racking attachment make a little bit more sense now. Here's the the plate that would be screwing on to the batten and it gives you a little bit of of freedom on on where this actually placed so that you can place it coming out the right spot of the tile. But then this this lifts up inside and then sneaks out of the tile and then gives you that L foot attachment point afterwards. Now on, on this particular Spanish tile project, says the YouTube audio cut. Can you check that? Mm -hmm. Um, it looks like it's still going for me. Well, Susan's going to check that. Oh, I hear it. Susan I hear it. hears it. Check your computer audio, Tay. Yeah, I hear it loud and clear. Um, when we did this Spanish tile roof, our problem was the product selection was so poor back in the day that we got up on that rooftop and we put these, these brackets through and it turned out that our bracket was not compatible with our particular kind of Spanish tile. You know, we had to measure out the Spanish tile. I had to use my mechanical engineering degree uh, to to dimension out my own bracket and go to a metal shop and make my own bracket just to get this project that we had already bid on and won installed. That was really problematic. You know, in, in today's industry, we're 10 years down the road and so now we have nice, um, you know, full tile replacements. So that's what we're watching here is a full tile replacement video. Uh, a tile would normally go in this position, but now quick mount has, you know, effectively created a tile replacement instead of those hooks. And so that makes a nice, flush, streamlined appearance. And so now those tile hooks are fading out of the market and the, a full tile replacement is what you do on a slate or Spanish tile rooftop. And, you know, I would say, hey, run away from tile rooftops. But the, the problem is uh, most customers who are buying tile rooftops also have the money for a solar array. So, you know, they will, they'll buy the tile roof and then later decide they want solar. And, and so you, you, you make it work. Now there's all kinds of solar customers in, in this industry. I had a solar customer who owned uh, a couple of high end luxury car dealerships. We're not talking about BMW. We're talking about like Bentley and Ferrari. Okay, so, so a whole nother level of car ownership. And he was building his retirement house. And, um, you know, I only had one conversation with the guy and his instructions were, I don't want it on my roof. I want it on my boat dock. And I don't care about the payback. I just want the very best product. And, and that was... You know, that, that was great. I'd love to have customers like yeah, that. Yeah, that'll happen to you twice in your life, too. Don't get all excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we're but trying I mean, sure, to... If you can pay for it, you can probably have most things you want. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's definitely a luxury solar market where you're going to be doing tile roof replacements. Um, but these projects are more rare and uh, rather than commonplace. But there's, there's products. This product replaces a slate tile. And then you can see Quick Mount has a, a similar product. And not just one. You know, this is, if depending on your tile rooftop, this tile rooftop is for a particular profile. And you can see it has three hops in it. And then this one is slightly different. It's for a, a much more shallow, longer undulation. And it has two hops instead of three. 
And so essentially, this is something that your solar designer is going to have to pick up on when it's a tile roof. They need to track down what exact tile is used on the roof. What's the exact you know, dimensions and cut sheet or do a very careful you know, drawing of the dimensions of the tile to give to your solar distributor to say, you know, hey, this is my tile. I need a, a racking solution that fits this particular tile. And but also, I think one of the, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that as as a solar professional, it's not your job to know every single thing that ever happens in in terms of construction. What you would be more likely to do is uh, work with a roofer. You know, and, and two things. One is other people know more than you do. And the other thing is you'll learn over time. But if you're really concerned about a roof, then the best thing you could do, especially as you're getting your career going, is develop a good relationship with a roofer in your area because you're probably going to work together more than once. You know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's always a good strategy getting started to work with um, other people that know what they're doing. Yeah, other trades. They don't have to be solar people, but you know, a roofer knows everything about roofing. An electrician knows everything about electrical. You know, you can be the person with the solar knowledge, and that might excuse a little bit of um, lack of knowledge in other trades you need to know. Just understand, you're going to have to make that knowledge up somewhere. So you industry well, partnerships you are, are. It's nice to give work to other other people too. You're going to have a friend that's a roofer someday, and you're going to want to help them out. So this will be how you do it. But also, the more you do it, the yeah. obviously the more comfortable you get with yeah. it. Yeah. So this this tile roofing system is quite nice because in this particular tile system, you can remove. Uh, a couple of tiles right out of the Spanish tile roof without taking you know the whole row apart. You know, not all Spanish tile systems are like that. I'd say the the more modern kind of prefabricated Spanish tile is is like this today, but Spanish tile roofs that are ten years or older aren't so nice. And so here, instead of attaching to this wood horizontal purlin beam, they're still lag screwing into the rafter. And you can see there's a little bit of flexibility in there. So where this, this standoff could actually be kind of located, it gives you that flexibility. So wherever you put that mount, it still gives you the, the degree of freedom to land the standoff where the hole is. Yeah, so let's, um, if you, Justin, when you're asking questions, let's try and, and tell, let's try and, and find the day two classroom channel and ask in there uh, so that I can keep the, the questions kind of separated by day. Uh, that'll, that'll help with discussion. Right, it doesn't totally matter, but if you go to think about this later and you're like, oh, that's what we talked about on the second day, it'll be easier to find questions. And so we're just testing that out. And so you'll be able to break it down by day when you go back and look at this later. So we're going to we're going to come back to racking in a couple days when we're, we're actually talking about array layout and installation in a little bit more detail. What we're trying to do now is just introduce components and terms but this is what the end result of a root of a standard shingle rooftop rack should look like so you know you have all these these flashed uh attachments uh by and large the industry standard and you can deviate from this but the industry standard is to do four foot on center distances between attachment points. Now the, the rail itself is generally rated for a six foot or eight foot on center span. 
you know, installers do four foot on center to be conservative. You know, a lot of times installers on residential projects are not going through an engineering process where they get an engineer to look at the drawings and, and stamp and sign off on the project structurally. And because they're not using an engineering stamp on their project, they want to be conservative in their install. And it's very conservative to do a four foot on center layout. And so every four feet, they're putting a, uh, they're putting a, a attachment point down. Uh, an advanced technique that is shown in this picture is a, a staggered layout. So you see how there's an attachment here and then on the next row up, it's one rafter over and then one rafter over and then one rafter over. So they're, they're caddy cornered kind of like that. They're staggered. And so here's your, your rafter, here's your rafter, here's your rafter, here's your rafter. You know, the reason why they're staggering their layouts, and you don't, you don't absolutely have to stagger your layouts. You can, you know, it's a lot easier just to put all the attachments down one rafter and then skip one and then all the attachments down one rafter and then skip one. And structurally, if you're going with four foot on center, that's okay too. But your advanced installers will will get their design game to the point where they're staggering their their L feet um, as a standard practice. And the reason is you want to hit if you can every single rafter as you're going across the rooftop with an attachment point. You know these 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 attachment points transfer any load from, from wind. You know, if the wind is trying to pick up the array, it's putting an equal and opposite force down onto the, um, onto the rafter. And so if you, if you stagger your attachment points, you get the most even load distribution across the the building itself and so you know generally speaking more the more uniform the load distribution the better it is for the rooftop and so this is this is our final point of course the the ends of the roof the edges of the roof all get an attachment because you're out of space you're down at the end and then uh so on this bottom rail they start two feet over with the next attachment and then go four feet, four feet, four feet. And then on the next rail up, instead of starting two feet over, you know, they start four feet over. And then go four feet, four feet. And so that's um uh that that gets you to that staggered uh attachment. And there's a little bit more nuance to that. There's less force on the roof in the middle of the array than there is on the edges of the array. And so we're going to be talking about that. I'll actually get into the solar design selection a little bit later. And watch these YouTube videos. Okay, here is something that is, uh, it's very important to know you, when you get out onto the utility scale site, this is something you can think about. The, de the decision and the design is probably already going to go for you, be made for you. But if you pull up the racking, the, the solar panel manufacturer's installation manuals, they will tell you, not in the module specification sheet, the little one-page sheet that, that tells you all the electrical details of the product, they're not going to tell you in this. You actually have to pull up the manufacturer's installation manual and read through it. But they will tell you very specific locations on where these clips that secure 
the 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 solar panel to the rack there's very specific you can't just put them anywhere you know in in utility scale trackers uh they might locate the clip in the middle of the panel but the clip is itself is going to be like two feet long um in that case when you're putting them up on the rooftop, the clips are very small. They might just be uh, an inch or two. And instead of being right in the middle of the panel, they're on the edges. There are specific rules that govern how far from the edge you can clip. And, and generally speaking, it's about uh, eight inches or so, you know, about eight inches. And so if you, if you put your clips further down into the middle of the array, then you get this edge overhanging and that causes flex in the panels and high wind can cause the panels to like vibrate a little. And um, if you don't put the, if you don't put the, the clips in the exact spot, you know, by, by exact spot, I mean there's, there is a little bit of a range. You know, this is saying between, for this particular module, they're saying between 9 and 16 inches. So scratch that, you know, a little bit more than, than 9, you know, about 9 inches in to 16 inches in. You know, if you're putting your clips 2 feet down the panel, that's a mistake. And so the clips kind of go you know, right before you get to the edge of the panel, about nine inches in, um, give or take. This is called a, a clamp zone. But there is some flexibility. So like here is a, a, a non, here's a non-traditional system where the clips, instead of going kind of inside the panel, the clips are going at the edges of the panel. Or here's another system where uh, this, this rail is taking the bottom edge of the panel instead of, you know, this, this figure A is the most traditional way. You're just clipping here, 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 and here. Uh, but there is flexibility. Now you can have the, the panel land across a rail you can clip the corners of the array only, or you could add more clips and more rail. And we're not gonna we're not gonna expect you to absorb this part of the information. But a, a solar engineer might look at these different clipping configurations and determine that one is better than another for a particular zone. Like if you're trying to make your uh, solar array category five hurricane proof, which, you know, I, I would normally expect for Florida and not for New Jersey, but, you know, I could understand a customer in New Jersey wanting to make their homes category five hurricane proof just to be prepared, you know? Adding this extra rail underneath the panels gives it additional strength. And so uh, generally where these clips are placed and where the rails are placed will, will make the array more strong so that if, if people do have questions like, well, what about putting solar in hurricane zones? You know, generally you just beef up the racking a little bit more. And then so, so most solar arrays have these rails going along the rooftop and then the modules just land on the rail and then there's this little clamping system where these clips just either they go in between the two solar modules and they're called mid clips or they go at the very end of the array and they're called end clips. And so now we can see, you know, this, uh, this clip here goes at the very edge of the 
of the panel, this clip would go right here for the very end of the of the line, whereas these clips go between two panels and and the module frames, you know, are are spaced on both sides of this little spacer. And so this is actually uh, a, a nice kind of enjoyable part of the job. You've already done all the shingle prying and very careful lag screw placement. And now you're just ready to, to put on a bunch of solar panels. Um, they just kind of get slapped onto this rack and then clipped down. And then the next one gets added. And then you screw in the mid clips and then you prep the next clips and then you add the next solar panel and then you screw in those mid clips and then you prep the next clips and then you add the next solar panel and you just kind of march it all the way down the rooftop. And you do something very similar on utility scale ground mounts. You know, you install your first solar panel and then you you know, screw in the end clips and prep the next clips and then you install the next solar panel and then you screw in, you know, those, those, you secure those clips and then you, you know, add the next clips and then you add the next solar panel <laughs> and then you screw in those clips and then you add the next clips. Now, whether that's on the roof or whether that's on the, the ground is the same way. And again, we're going to come back to this on probably on Thursday when we focus a little bit more on installation. You don't have to use rail. Um, this is an example of a railless system where instead of running rail along these attachments, and then putting the solar panels on the rail, you know, they say, well, let's just get rid of the rail. You know, let's, let's make our attachments a little bit more robust and just put the panels directly down on the attachments. And so that's, that's a very popular system. For beginners, I would stay away from these railless systems because you have to be very very precise on how these panels lay onto these attachment points with with rail going down and then the modules themselves get to hang over the rail a bit that's a little bit more forgiving you know you have a you know you have to start that rail about nine inches down and that rail has to end uh, you know, no more than about 16 inches down, but you got that, that gap of, of spacing, uh, that tolerance for where your attachments go and where the rails go. When you, when you get rid of the rail, when you no longer have that rail, when you no longer have that overhang and you use a rail system, you have to be very, very precise to make sure that it all fits and lines up as it should. So most solar installers are using rail-based systems and only, you know, kind of the most experienced crews uh, move over to a rail system, which is a little bit cheaper, not much cheaper, but a little bit. Okay, let's talk about a solar panel. How's that sound? It's a solar class. We should talk about solar panels. Um, when imagining a solar panel, you got to you got to keep in mind that they're going to make these panels so that you can pick them up and move them around. And so, um, they are about as wide as what one, you know, person can can pick up and reach their arms around, okay? 
And so that means that the, the a typical solar panel is about three and a third feet wide. You know, and so you could imagine sticking your, your arms out, you know, just a little bit wide, but not too much, so that you can grab around the edges of the solar panel and pick it up. You know, if it got any wider than about three and a third feet, you wouldn't be able to pick it up. You need two people instead of one person. So the, the solar panels are about three and a third feet wide. The difference between what you'll install on a utility scale project versus a residential project is the utility scale panels are a little bit taller. They're about six feet tall. Whereas the, the panel, a, a residential solar panel is about five feet tall. You know, it, uh, at the utility scale, this this extra height, you know, it becomes a little bit of a hazard to pick up and walk around if you are up on top of a roof. You know, if you're up on top of a roof, a three and a third by six and a third foot solar panel is just a little bit too large, a little bit too heavy. You know, so your residential rooftop panels, which are smaller, are about three and a third feet by five and a third feet. You know, so about as wide as what you can pick up comfortably and about as tall as what you can pick up and still, you know, kind of see over. In other words, a solar panel is a little bit larger than three feet by five feet. It's about three and a third feet by five and a third feet. Maybe slightly larger at the utility scale. Now there there are technical terms to, to call, you know, we just say, oh, that's a residential panel or that's a utility scale panel. You know, in fact, you could use utility scale panels on a residential roof, or you could use residential panels on a utility scale project. They're, they're much more interchangeable than, than those categories would suggest. The technical term for the residential panel is a, a 60 cell panel. And the technical term for utility scale is a 72 cell panel. Well, what does that mean? Well, you can actually count these little circles in the panel. These are called cells. Like um, Duracell batteries. One battery is a cell. And when you have multiple batteries stacked up together, that's also called a battery. You know, there's one battery... You know, four batteries stacked up together is also called a battery. The individual component technically is called a cell. And so these individual components of a solar module are called cells. And you can count them up. We got, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 cells. And we got one, two, three, four, five, six cells. Six times 12 is 72. So this is a 72 cell solar panel because it literally has 72 silicon cells inside of it. Now this panel, it's a little bit harder to see, but I'll draw it out for you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cells by one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is six cells by ten cells. And so you know, that is a 60 cell panel. Well, 
72 cell panel, 60 cell panel. You know, the, the reason why I mentioned this is this is something you would bring up in, in a, a job interview to indicate to the interviewer that you know a little bit about solar. You know, so if you're in, installing in a, a, a utility scale panel you know, system, you could say, oh, are you using 72 cell panels? And they'll say, oh, you know, you know what you're talking about. And you can say, no, nah, you know, I just took a solar class. But they'll think, well, you paid attention because you know the technical terms. You know, so you... Utility scale projects generally use larger panels called 72 cell panels. Residential projects use a little bit shorter. And the difference is the 72 cell panels have, you know, an extra two cells. This has 10 rows. This has 12 rows. The cells are the same size, more or less. And so with 12 rows, you're, they're just going to be a little bit taller. And so a residential solar panel is three feet by five feet or a little bit more than that. A utility scale panel is about three feet by six feet or slightly more than that. A residential solar panel is about 40 pounds. A 72 cell panel is, you know, about 20% larger. It's about 20% heavier too. You know, so a utility scale panel weighs about 48 pounds and so um, you know you, you start to do some heavy lifting in in solar you might on a big crew you might have two people picking the panels up from the pallet passing it off to one guy to walk over to where it needs to be and then have two people landed on the rack So these 72 cell panels are just a little bit larger. That makes them a little bit cheaper by the watt. You know, you can fit a few more watts on the same rack because the panel is a little bit larger. Uh, solar panels are rated for outdoor use. You know, manufacturers know that a solar panel is supposed to go outside in the sun on a roof. So they are able to withstand the elements. You know, they can take most hail. Now, the kind of hail that you get up on the northeast coast, if you ever get hail on the northeast coast, the solar array is, is not only is it going to protect the roof, but it's going to be able to take that hail damage no problem. Uh, I started my career in Central Texas. And Central Texas and Oklahoma have the worst hail in the country. And I saw one of these just jaw-dropping hailstorms like you would never believe i mean we're talking about like baseball sized hail like like oh my god if you go outside right now you will die because it's like we're living on a different planet kind of hail you know this is the kind of hail that you would go out in the parking lot and every single car in the parking lot smash to smithereens you know not just the windshield and the rear windshield but the side mirrors and the sunroof i mean every bit of glass obliterated you know uh roofing contractors are throwing parties because they see two years of work ahead of them i mean just a crazy crazy hailstorm and I say that because we took a service call. We had maybe at that time 10 systems installed. And only one of our systems got hail damage. And out of that one system, only 10% of the solar panels got hail damage. And this is a hail storm where every roof in the neighborhood needed to be replaced. So... You know, hey, solar does withstand hail and rain and, uh, 
And we have a question like, do solar panels have differences based on their location for weather? The, the only real difference is the thickness of this module frame. You can, you can find solar panels that have more robust and a little bit thicker module frames that are better suited for hurricane zones. But you really don't see much consideration and product nuance for hail. You know, generally a, a more robust frame is going to result in a more robust panel. But I don't, I don't know of any panels that, that compete on their hail ratings. And, and that is because most hail in the United States is well within the, the rated tolerance of a solar panel. You know, you, you really only um, very, very rare hailstorms in Oklahoma and Central Texas will exceed the rating of a solar array 